All right. Um, thank you all for joining us um, for this special event tonight. Um, I'm just going to start with a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, um, please do keep your microphone and your cameras turned off so that we can all clearly see the authors as they're speaking. Um, also, there will be a question and answer period at the end. So if you have questions or comments for the authors, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, and if you're not able to see the chat right now, you can um, turn that on in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. A um, couple of upcoming events that we have at Belmont Books. This Thursday at 7 p.m., we're gonna have a book launch for The Last Tang Standing by Lauren Ho, and she's going to be in conversation with Mary Pauline Lowry. Um, also next week on June 18th, we have the book launch for The Gretchen Question, which is the next book by Jessica Treadway. And she's going to be in conversation with Julia Glass. You can sign up for these events and many, many more um, at belmontbooks.com slash event. That's E-V-E-N-T, there's no S. Um, also a big announcement, this week we have open for curbside pickup. So we're gonna be doing curbside pickup windows Monday through Friday from two until 6 p.m. And then also Saturdays from 12 until four. And the way that you sign up for that is you just order the book on our website and then just as you would select your shipping option, you'll select curbside pickup. Um, we will still continue to offer shipping through the post office priority mail, media mail, and ground. Um, okay, and with that, let's go ahead and get to the authors. Um, Lisa Braxton's stories and essays have appeared in Vermont Literary Review, Black Lives Have Always Mattered, Chicken Soup for the Soul, and The Book of Hope. She's a fellow of the Cambilio Fiction Writers Work program, excuse me, and a book reviewer for 2040 Review. The Talking Drum is her first novel. And I just have to say, it just came out and it's already sold out all across the internet. So if you want this book, order it from us right away. Um, and I will have links to all the books that are mentioned in the chat. So do be sure and follow the chat. Um, next, Hallie Efron is a New York Times bestselling author, Edgar Award finalist, and five-time finalist for the Mary Higgins Clark Award. Her latest novel is Careful What You Wish For, which you can order in hardcover immediately on our website, or is also available in paperback for pre-order. So welcome, Lisa and Hallie. Thanks for having us. I think Hallie's on mute. Unmute myself. Unmute myself. I've never had to do that before. <laughs> anyway, what I was saying is, I can't believe, I'm, I feel really fortunate that Lisa asked me to come because her book is something pretty special uh, at this time, in this place. Even though it's set in 1971, it is so current. So I have to ask her, where did you get the idea? And and I mean, have you been working on it since 1971 or did you take yourself back to that time? No, I was I was a, a kid back in 1971, but I, um, I began working on it in 2008. I entered an um, MFA program at Southern New Hampshire University in 2008 and I worked on it for to get my diploma, my, get my graduate degree for two years. I was shepherded by the professors who were all published novelists. And so I worked on it until 2010. And from that point, I continued to revise it, just tightening up the story until I got uh, the publisher and other publications in 2017 signed me to a contract. So the, the story as it is, the themes that are throughout the book were in place by 2010. And was there a moment like when the idea came to you for the book? I mean, uh, that, that spark, something that happened to you that shook you up and you said, I need to write about this? Actually, no, I, I had a scene, a seven page scene about a man and a woman in a bookstore and the woman wants to get back together with him. They had a relationship in the past and she wants to for them to rekindle their rom romance. And I was writing that and I, I, I hit a wall with that little story and I didn't know where to go with it. And so I said, I, I was thinking that I would like to include an African drummer. So I added an African drummer to the story. And I was, I, I basically took one step after the other. But after I added the African drummer, for some reason, the idea of urban redevelopment and gentrification came to me. I think it was in my subconscious because my parents owned and operated a clothing store beginning 
in 1969 until the uh, early mid early 2000s and I was as a little kid at the store with my parents um, helping customers and 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 waiting on customers and, and charging up uh, sales and, and things of that nature and I was um I was watching you know the black power movement um, come into force it was a few years after Dr. King was killed and the black arts movement was very big at that time and to write my first novel I wanted to have at least something in the novel that I felt comfortable with that I had experienced, even as a, even though I was a, a child, that I knew about because so much of what I had to write was required research, and I didn't have a comfort level in a lot of the different things I wrote about. So at least I knew about that era through what well, myself and through the eyes of my parents and what what they lived through with, with what was going on. Was that a neighborhood that became gentrified in the way that uh, the neighborhood in your in in um, in your in in talking the talking drum does yes in uh, bridgeport connecticut my hometown the uh, neighborhood is it's the east end of bridgeport and where my parents store was and uh, not too far from the waterfront from the harbor and homes over the years were taken by um, eminent domain and my parents customary base got smaller and smaller and also bridgeport at one time was a powerhouse uh, factory city and in fact my parents moved to bridgeport in 1956 my, uh, my father worked at General Electric for years. My mother worked there briefly. And those factories left. They either went overseas or they, they closed down. So, so much of the, of the customer base was, was um, going away, as well as uh, the financial situation of Bridgeport itself was suffering. So we have seen gentrification over the years. A lot of properties were taken. And years and years later, now, there is, a, there is building going on. Of, um, there, putting in luxury restaurants and some high upscale chain stores and the strip where my parents store was on which and there were a number of um, black owned businesses at that time that's um, being leveled and they're putting in shops and um, apartment buildings so it's all it's all changing yeah it felt very much like Boston I know it's not Boston because I read the book jacket but if I hadn't known that I would have thought you know, uh, Mattapan or Dorchester or any of the, uh, I live south of Boston, I know you do too. Um, any of our, 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 our people just drifted out of those neighborhoods or, or were pushed. And there's that's been, really what you're writing about is the pushing. Yes, there's been a lot of that along the Eastern seaboard cities and probably, and in, in, in I know Pittsburgh has seen it. I have a good friend in Pittsburgh and we've walked around and gone to the, uh, the the upscale ice cream shop, and she was saying, "Well, this neighborhood used to be uh, working class and very different." So we see this along the Eastern Seaboard, and of course, we do see that in in Boston, also. In fact, I was at the I was going to an event in South Boston recently, and I didn't know where I was. It was it was it was just so built up, and a lot of nice restaurants. And I drove around the corner, and it's like, "Oh yeah, here I'm at, I'm at South Bay." But the, the back end of it is not like it was. And so whoever was there, they've been pushed out and, and now it's gone upscale. So we see that throughout the Boston area. Yeah. The char There's a lot going on in your book. You actually have, I, I would count at least three um, couples and their lives and interactions and drama. And then you also have um, the the background and eventually they all come together. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, do you think who, who who's your protagonist? Who do you think of as the central character in the book? Because it's such a rich cast. I, I know my answer. I'm wondering if yours is gonna be the same. Well, I see, I see, oh, the central um oh, what, protagonist, uh, are we speaking of a female character or well, you tell me, is the main character female or male? I wrote the book intending that the main character is Sydney. That's and, yeah. Okay, so Sydney is actually, she's a composite. She's um, a fictional character, but I drew elements of myself into the character. I drew elements of my mother into the character actually. Really? Because Sydney is supporting, and, and she's supporting her husband's desire to open up um, a business. He, he wants to open up a, you know, a business that will attract uh, people to come into the bookstore and, and talk about the issues of the day and he wants to, to generate activism and you know intellectual learning through through the books he wants to stock there and my mother supported my father's dream he had a dream since childhood 
open up his uh, own clothing store when he was a child actually he had a store because in rural Virginia and I guess throughout the country back um, during that era many decades ago stores were not open on Sundays so he would go into the stores little stores and buy candy and different things and then to open up his store his store on the weekend on Sundays and, pe and doubled the price of things because people couldn't get anything any other way because the stores weren't open. So she supported his dream to open up this store. And I see Sydney as um, a shy, rather shy, quiet person who loves different things. She enjoys, she um, loves photography, which I love photography. She is looking at law school. She was in law school, had a fellowship, but she also likes journalism. And I, I, I like journalism. I could not decide what I wanted to do. So I've had a, a rather checkerboard career of, of television, radio, newspapers, um, um, editing. I've, I've done all these different things. And, and she's trying to find her voice and become more assertive. That's something that I've been challenged with um, during my life. So she's, yeah, she's my protagonist and she's a combination of, of different, um, different elements. And the, the, the store that her husband wants to open, can you tell us about that? Because I found that really charming. Well, yes, he's, it's a protest bookstore. And the bookstore is on the first level, and they live upstairs. And he sees it as a way to bring about activism. He was an academic at a college uh, university in Western Massachusetts. He did not get tenure. He's upset. He's fed up with it. Besides, he wants to come back to his hometown and open up a bookstore and have scholars come in, have um, book readings, um, play plays, maybe um, contests for children to do uh, writing essay essay contests, things of that nature. So that's um, that's what that that's what that is. And I think that's uh, that idea of aspiring to something. That for Sydney, she aspires. She's not sure what she aspires to be, but it but it's for the moment at least not the law school that she got into. She wants. And, and there's the the guy that she wants to be with and 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 there's also the man who who wants to open a drumming school it there's a lot of characters here that are reaching and trying to get through today and pay their bills while aspirational at the same time can you talk a little bit about that well the character omar is a drummer from senegal and he was um in the right place at the right time in the capital city of Dakar back in 1960, early 1960s, he was invited, his father is a master drummer, a griot um, storyteller, master drummer, and has been invited to go to the Festival, the festival of the Black Arts, which uh, really did exist, that, that did happen. And while Omar is there, he um, and his um, father are drumming with the other drummers, they've been practicing for weeks for this special event. And then Duke Ellington, the, um, the, the pianist and the orchestra, orchestra leader, comes out of Amity Pavilion with the president of, of Senegal. And as it turns out, Duke Ellington loves the way Omar plays the drums and gets him into Howard University, which he uh, does go to. And then at some point, something happens and he ends up in Belport. And his uncle Mustafa looks, uh, is his godfather basically. And, and helps him um, to make his way there. But he is hoping to become the drumming ambassador of the world. He feels that, and his father felt like in Senegal, that the world did not appreciate African drumming as um, other musical arts were appreciated. And so he was saying, so uh, Ibrahim, the dad said to his son, you know, when, when you grow up, you were going to be the drumming ambassador of the world. So Omar kept that tucked in with him, that idea. And then he comes to the US and ends up in Belport and he's facing some struggles, but he is just determined. He wants to make this happen, that he is the drumming ambassador of the world. That's the title of the book, too, Talking Drum, The Talking Drum. And so I know a little bit about uh, drums. Um, as in music, I know a little bit about them as forms of communication among groups that are too far away to holler at, but loud enough, uh, close enough to hear the drums that they're, they're actually used for communicating. And I'm wondering, it's a metaphor, isn't it? The talking drum, at, while it's also, uh, you know, the name of the store kind of, I mean, the name of the school. Well, the, the talking drum um, harkens back to the talking drums in African villages where the drum was used to um, communicate, to let people know about uh, weddings, 
and calls to war or, or christenings or any rites of passage or let's have a meeting. So that's why, um, that's why Malachi, the owner of the, he and his wife, you know, sitting on the bookstore, he wants to call his bookstore the Talking Drum Bookstore and Cultural Center because he wants it to be a place where people communicate. They come together, they gather, and they talk, and they have intellectual conversations. But there is literally, as I learned, because I actually took drumming lessons, and, and I, I didn't know there were so many different kinds of African drums, but there actually is a talking drum that, um, that um, Omar's buddy, his buddy and his frenemy, because um, they, they, have a, they have an interesting relationship. Uh, Kadim, his friend, his, his partner in the drumming duo that they do, they're called the Fulani Sound. And so um, the drum is, the, the talking drum is the kind of drum that you take and you put it under your arm and you squeeze it and you pat it and it makes the sound as if it's talking. So there are a few different meanings of the talking drum in the story. That's fascinating. And did you learn to play that kind of drum when you took drumming lessons or? I didn't learn to play that drum. I learned to play the djembe, which is I guess the most popular or the most well-known of the African drums. And I took lessons with um, adult education lessons. Then I went to a drumming school just outside of Boston. And it was uh, one of the most humbling experiences of my life because when I see people drumming, it looks like it's really easy. Like you're just going like this, but it is so intricate and there's so many different intricate patterns that you can use. And there are certain ways you hit this part onto the drum and, and a certain way you hit this part onto the drum. And it, the, the moves are just so, so detailed. And I went to a master class with a master drummer. I think he's from, I think he was from, I think he was from Ghana. And so I went to, it was City Hall in, in a town north of Boston. And it was filled with, it must have been about 100, 150 people in this room who look like regular people, well, they are regular people, but they were just serious into drumming. Yeah. And I heard people around me saying, well, I know there's some people here who aren't that serious about it. And they should just go home. And I was like, and I was saying to them, well, I'm writing a novel and that's why I'm, <laughs> that's why I'm here. So if, you know, that's why I sound like I sound. And the funny thing was, was the instructor, he would, he had a, an assistant who would do the intricate um, moves, you know, on, on the drum. And then he would look at all, all of us and have us repeat it. And he would go around the room and look at all of us to make sure we were, we were doing it properly and our hands were proper and we were sitting properly. And he kept coming back to me <laughs> and stopping me and everybody be quiet. Okay, you do it. And then I had to do it and it was always wrong because, and I said, to him, I'm writing a novel. I'm not a serious drummer. I'm just, I'm just here to learn about drumming to write the novel. He said, oh, okay, that's fine. And, and then it, once I announced that to everybody, it was, it was more relaxed, but they, they were very, very intense. Well, one of the, one of the parts of the book, um, and then in a minute, I'm going to ask you to, to read a little bit from the book too. But um, one of the things I loved is there's a point in the book where a little girl who is troubled, she has a lot of issues. She's sat a tough time and there's probably something more going on there than just behavior issues, I would say. I don't know what you had in mind, but uh, she feels very real and she can drum. And I, there's that great moment, I hope I'm not giving anything away, but I love that moment in the book where she kind of comes into her own. And I love the way you use that uh, to show her kind of opening up like a flower and showing her ability rather than her disabilities. So I was wondering, uh, can I ask, do you have kids? Because she felt very genuine. No, I, I don't have children. No, nieces, no. Yeah. She's, I, I have a granddaughter and it felt very real to me. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So how did you, how did you write her? What kind of, I mean, you can't go to drumming school to write a little girl, but you absolutely captured her. Do, do you have a, a little girl in your life who? Hmm. And you know, I, with, with that particular character, Jasmine, that's Jasmine, I, um, I totally used my imagination. That was completely from my imagination. There was no one inspired by her, no. Mm -mm. Well, she's really not a placeholder. She's a real little person. And I, my hat off to you because I really felt, sometimes authors stick little kids in their books and they're just kind of like plot points. And she definitely is not. She's got her own little mind and, uh, and she, 
<laughs> she's a handful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's a handful, that is for sure. Yeah. So Lisa, would you like to read a little bit? Oh, sure. And then we'll and then we'll do some more and we'll take questions. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna read a, a very very short piece. And in this particular chapter, without giving much away, Omar, my my drummer, he he thinks that his wife, Natalie, might be having an affair with her voice coach. She's uh, she wants to become a professional singer. And so he goes to his uncle Mustafa for advice. And his uncle says, well, you need to go over and she's the voice coach's house to see what's going on. And that way you'll, you'll know for sure whether or not she's cheating. And when I open this up, this part, um, she, he has borrowed a, a, a vehicle that his uncle has allowed him to borrow. And he's right now in the car driving over to the voice coach's house. Now with his hands on the steering wheel, he was grateful that uncle allowed him to borrow the renter's car, even though he had never driven a car as bulky as a Lincoln. It reminded him of a small bus. The front end was so long, he worried he would rear end another car. He was glad he took uncle's advice and left early so he could arrive long before Natalie's lesson was over. It was best that he know for sure whether or not Natalie was cheating. He leaned across the seat, attempting to smooth out the creases in the map. When he got to the block that uncle had marked with a big blue star, he began checking the house numbers on the mailboxes by the side of the road. The homes were hidden behind tall hedges. He parked by the mailbox with the voice coach's name on it, Costopolis. Omar walked carefully, his ankle still sore from twisting it weeks ago. As he stepped under the porch, his heart pounded. He pressed the doorbell. A speaker emitted classical music. No one answered. He squeezed the handle on the double doors and pushed slightly just to test them. To his surprise, the doors opened. He stepped into a brightly lit foyer with a glass chandelier hanging high above his head. He thought about stepping back onto the porch to ring the bell again or calling out to someone, but decided against it. He heard sound coming from the second floor, giggling. It was Natalie. He was sure of it. Omar slowly climbed the sweeping carpeted staircase, careful not to make a noise. When he got to the second floor landing, he stopped and listened, holding his breath. He heard a man's voice. The sound was to his right. His palms sweaty on the banister, he followed the sound all the way to the end of the hall to a large room with dark hardwood floors. It wasn't a bedroom. He breathed easier. When he peeked in, he saw the voice coach, his dark curly hair resting on his shoulders, sitting at a grand piano facing away from the doorway. Natalie was standing next to the coach, looking over his shoulder at some sheet music, her back also to the door. She was holding a glass of white wine. Another wine glass, half filled, was on top of the piano. The voice coach leaned over to her and said something. In response, Natalie threw her head back and laughed harder than Omar had ever seen before. Her shoulders shook. He tried to think of what to do next. He stepped into the room. Then he took another step. An uneven floorboard creaked. Natalie stopped laughing and swung her head around. Her smile dissolved and twisted into a grimace. The voice coach looked up at Natalie and then turned around on the piano bench toward Omar. How did you get in here? He shouted in his heavy accent. Natalie touched the man lightly on the arm and explained that Omar was her husband. I'll talk to him, she said. Omar was incensed. Natalie seemed apologetic as if Omar was a pest, a bug that had to be swept away. Why are you here? She whispered loudly after she hurried to meet him in the doorway. I wanted to surprise you, take you out for a dinner meal. She rolled her eyes. You're lying. When was the last time you took me out? She looked back at the voice coach and raised a finger indicating that she'd be back momentarily. Omar followed her out of the room. I know why you're here, she snapped when they got to the curb. You're spying on me. You have these ideas rolling around in your head. What you need to be doing is finding us a better place to live. He gestured toward the Lincoln. I appear in this nice automobile and you do not even appreciate it. She folded her arms across her chest and looked the car up and down. Where'd you get this from? Uncle let me borrow it. She smirked. You think I'm gonna get in that thing, that gangster ride? 
You must be crazy. Before he could respond, she turned on her heels, went back into the house, slammed the door. Which is the perfect segue to my next question, which is this book is full of what, when I teach writing, I always tell people, you have to have in the book in order to make the reader want to keep turning the pages. And that's conflict. You have marriages that are falling apart. You have generations that are at each other's throats. You have rich and poor haves and have nots. You have uh, tenants and, and owners of buildings. You have black Americans and black Africans who have their own kinds of differences. And I was wondering if you consciously think about that and, and what are some of the conflicts that you feel are, are so essential to this book? Well, I, I do have, a, like, as you said, a number of conflicts um, and many different ones. And I wanted to write about the differences and the biases that I see among, for example, um, uh, people of African ancestry from uh, different cultures. I see that among uh, people who are from Africa. I see that among people who are from the Caribbean, for instance, and I see that among black Americans. And I, I, I see conflict among those groups. And I'm, I'm thinking that if you go back far enough, we're all from the same place, but I, I see where people make a, a lot of differences and, and, and put each other down and that can affect, and affect, uh, affect individuals. And what I really wanted to, I want to explore that because I think it's a, a great um, springboard for some very important conversations that we need to have. Yeah, I noticed the Senegalese culture is, is very important in the book because one of your characters comes from there. And so you have a neighborhood called Petite Africa, which immediately you think in French, West Africa probably, or Africa, at least where French was spoken and still is. And it has a very different feeling, say, than, I mean, Africa's a huge continent, you know, uh, and, you know, in Boston, it's all about Ireland. <laughs> it always cracks me up. And, and then Africa will get one song, you know, in a thing. And, and, and Africa is enormous and so full, full of different cultures. Have you been to Africa? Why did you pick Senegal as the, uh, or French Africa at any rate? Well, I, I have been to Africa. I've been to South Africa twice on business, and I've been to Morocco as part of a trip I took to Spain. Um, a friend of, my, of mine and I, who, we were traveling together, and we said, we were in the south of Spain, so we said, well, gee, if we're going to be in the south of Spain, let's at least go to the, the, the mother country, mother continent. Uh, and so we were able to take a ferry over to Morocco. We took the Ibn Battuta. Did you take the Ibn Battuta? That's the, that's the ferry from... Um... I've been on that ferry, <laughs> but go ahead. I'm not sure. You know what? I've actually forgotten what your question was. If you can repeat it, please. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I was wondering, uh, you know, which parts of Africa you were drawing from and if you had had per firsthand experience, either with African friends, which I didn't ask, or, or actually having been there or tried to, in a work environment, you know, because you're so tuned into uh, the differences. I was wondering where that came from. So when I, when I went to South Africa, that I drew some of what I saw when I was in South Africa to, to create Omar's village where he uh, grew up in, um, in uh, Senegal. But in addition to that, uh, I found a Senegalese restaurant in Boston, South Boston, and I went in and had dinner and talked with the owner and, um, asked, and told her about the book I was writing. And she said, uh, sure, she, I would, she would talk to me at any time. And she agreed to have her friends from Senegal who live in Boston come meet with me at the restaurant on a, you know, a next occasion when I went there. And we talked quite a bit. They told me quite a bit about the culture. They gave me some books to read. In addition to that, I, I went to the library and did a whole lot of um, research. And also I wanted to, I mean, my characters speak Wolof. That's their language in Senegal. And you'll see some of the Wolof words uh, sprinkled throughout. And I went on, on YouTube and I watched people from Senegal speaking the language. I wanted to really get the feel, you know, the feel for that. Can you, uh, can you spell what that language is? Because that's a word I haven't heard before. W-O-L-O-F. W-O-L-O-F. Okay. I didn't know that. 
Okay. And what I did do is I, I found a, um, a Peace Corps dictionary to uh, learn what some of the words were for the book. And through the restaurant owner, through kept connecting to her on Facebook, to her friends on Facebook, I would check some of the words with them on Facebook and say, I'm saying these words for this sentence. Does this sound right to you? And they would re reply. Another fault line in the book is between men and women. I mean, there's a lot of uh, gender specific uh, differences that make it very hard for the characters, I would say, to trust each other hmm. because of those differences. And I was wondering if you were thinking about that when you when you wrote them, because each of them, there's a few marriages or maybe some aren't married, but couples at any rate. Um, and each one of those relationships is slightly different in the way that it's dysfunctional, but they're almost all dysfunctional. Right, right. I, I was really just separately just drawing conflict, creating conflict for each one of those couples. And not, I really hadn't thought about their gender issue with um, the conflict. But I guess it just turned out that that's the way it, it turned out. But I just, as I was naturally writing, I just felt that, that these conflicts seemed to be fitting for these couples. But I was looking at it so, so closely, I didn't see where it was, you know, there was a gender, gender, issue there, gender issue there. Well, what I did pick up a lot in the book, I, I always write, my books are always, always at their core about who can you trust and how can you know. And I felt you were also working in the same turf with your book each of each of your characters is betrayed in some way and then has to figure out who can i trust neighbors friends wives husbands i think it was probably in my subconscious somewhere and i hadn't i actually hadn't looked at it that way yeah hmm. i i and again because i because i write with that theme. The other thing I, that is true in my books is I write a lot of houses. I love to write houses and there's a spectacular house in your book. Can you tell us about that house? I love that house. Yes, yes, the, the house, the Victorian house where the, the, the uh, Talking Drums bookstore is and where the couple lives is based on a house I lived in in Dorchester when I first moved to Boston. And I was renting a room from my sister's mother-in-law and in the Upham's Corner section of Dorchester, this lovely Victorian house, you walk in and with these polished, lovely uh, hardwood floors and uh, the, the fireplace, the sweeping mahogany staircase, a sitting room, three levels, a garden outdoors, the, this high ceilings, a checkerboard kitchen floor, it was lovely. And so I, I she, um, my um, sister's mother-in-law's name is Anne. So Anne and the way she decorated her house and the, the, the bones of the house itself inspired the house and the talking drum. I love that. I think we actually looked at a house in Upham's Corner at one point that was up on a hill, a big Victorian, three floors. It was overwhelming just even imagining how one might keep one, a house like that clean. But, uh, but I so remember, did it have a view? Was it like up on a hill? No, no, it was on a, just right there, tucked in on a main, on a, a regular flat road. Yeah. Um, no, no, but the view was lovely in the backyard because of the gardening that was done there. Well, it sounds like uh, a house I would have uh, loved, and, and it was great that you put the book there. Um, but also the whole neighborhood. Do you, do you map out neighborhoods when you write them? Because that's a pretty complicated neighborhood you drew. I mean, no, I, I, I did I, after a while, I was not able to keep straight my streets right. and the neighborhood. So I just so happened to have the map that I created for the talking drum. If you can see it, I don't know how well you can see this, but it's that's this is Bellport, and you might be able to see the bridge there. And I have all the streets mapped out. Went to Michael's craft store and, and made this up. I put a key in there so yeah. that I could keep straight, you know, who was going where and, and what made sense. Because after a while, I mean, I was thinking when I was first writing, oh, I can remember all these streets. But after a while, I was like, I cannot, I have to map this out. Have to map it out yeah. I'm not going to know. Did you map the house out as well? And where the bedrooms were and where the... I did. I, I, I did create a floor plan for the house. I had to because 
I had um, friends who, would, who were looking at the book and the early manuscript and saying, this doesn't make sense. If they're going there, how could they be over there? So I had to map it out. I, I went, I got architectural plans out of the library of Victorian houses and I mapped out. That's fascinating. The floors That's fascinating. And, the rooms. and did you, you all, the other complicated thing in your book is that you really have several plots that come together. There's different characters and they all have some kind of link to one another. And then they eventually, so how did, to with, that would have driven me crazy driving, <laughs> uh, right, driving that, writing that. You almost need a map up for your plot. How did you conquer that? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't that pretty. It was pretty messy. And I had all these different stories going on. And uh, I had to figure out a way to make them fit. And let me just say that, as I mentioned, I began, this, <laughs> began the project in 2008 and got the contract in 2017. So that tells you right there. <laughs> I just kept working on it and working on it. And I was working on it and I was saying, See, what I have, I had other characters too, and I had other stories too, but then I would, I would get rid of those characters and say, oh, well, this character can, I, I merge characters, and, and, and I, I just merged some things that were going on to make them be there. So it just, I just had to, it was like a, like a soup, making a soup, but trying to make a stew out of a soup. You just did keep you, working on it. Did you write outlines with different threads in them? I did. I had, I had um, index cards for each one of my characters. Yeah, wow, wow. Um, just so you know, I mean, it took me 10 years to write my first book, to get my first book okay. published. Okay. No, to, to get to where I was even confident enough to send it out, 10 years. And I once heard Dennis Lehane say that the biggest mistake that aspiring writers make is they think it's going to happen overnight. And that the, his, in his experience, the average amount of time to go from starting to write to having a publisher is 10 years. So well, that's, I feel less embarrassed now. Thank, thank you. Yeah, you can say Dennis Lehane said it's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have a few questions over there. Uh, Michelle Steinberg says, not a question, but a compliment. I'm a little more than halfway through the book, and I think the way you've created suspense is irresistible. Your characters okay. feel very real. Can you talk about suspense? Do you think about suspense when you're writing? Well, I have to say, Hallie, I think about suspense when I'm writing, and you helped me with that, actually. I did. Yes, you did. I, I took a master class from you at Grub Street Writing Center. On, um, it was a one night class on suspense writing. And then after the class, you and I were both on the platform on the red line waiting for the train. And I was telling you about this. I told you about this novel I was beginning to write and I was kind of stuck. And I wanted to add some suspense to it. So you gave me some very good ideas. And then I went out and I bought your book, Writing and Selling Your Mystery Novel. And, that, and I, I use it as a reference as I was writing the talk and drop. So the, the part where I read about Omar going up the stairs slowly, he's being quiet, and then he, and then the, 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 the uh, hardwood floor creaks. That, I, I got some pointers on writing that from, from you, from your, from your class. Well, I noticed when you were reading it, I started to lean in as you were reading that part, and that's what you want readers to do is yes. be right in the moment with the sen all the sensory things. Oh, you're so sweet. I actually remember that ride. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah I, hadn't, I had not remembered that it was Grub Street. I don't think I've taught there since then. Uh, wow. That had to be about 10 years ago or so. Yeah, it was a, it was a long time ago, yeah. yeah. Okay, from Sheila McShane, what type of book would you want to write following the talk? You've probably already written it, The Talking Drum. Well, I, I have begun writing another one, and um, I'll just say that it takes place in the 1850s in Boston, and um, that's what all I'd like to say. I don't want to give too much away, but I've got a couple hundred pages in at this point. The 1850s, so that's pre-Civil War. Pre-Civil War, the Fugitive, Fugitive Slave Act had um, gone into place, so there are bounty hunters throughout Boston you know, searching for escaped slaves. There are free African Americans um, who escaped years ago and then there are some who are you know are free and um there's some other things going on that i hope will make it suspenseful wow. interesting Is, when were the do you know when the civil war draft riots were because those I, were i think later i think yeah. but not too much later anyway oh that sounds fascinating and how far along are you a couple of hundred pages in and i'm hoping 
uh, within the, the month or so to get back. To, I have time to put it aside for, for the time being because of the talking drum, but hopefully I'll get back to it in another month or so. That's great. That's great. Okay, we have a question from Angie Chapman to everyone. It sounds like you used a lot of your skills honed as a journalist, like research. I would also add listening, which is what journalists have to do. How else has your journalism background and experience helped you with the writing? Um, well, for one thing, when I was a, a, a daily newspaper journalist, you have to deal with editors. And uh, to get a story in the newspaper, you go through a battery of editors, your copy editor, and then you go on to an editor who's beyond that level and the managing editor, at least at the news newspaper I was working at. So I'm used to editing and I'm used to criticism. And I understand that to make a story better, if you have a very good editor, you could, they can help you to make your story better. Even though once you've handed something in, you might feel like it's, it's your masterpiece. Yeah. You have to be able to let it go and have fresh eyes look at it. Someone who is skilled in editing look at it to help to make it better. And also with deadlines, I had to I had to um, produce a story for the newspaper when I had to produce it on that deadline, and I had to make that deadline. When I was a TV reporter, you had to have your story in. Let's say for the ten o'clock newscast, you had to have it in by eight thirty, let's say at the latest. So no matter what, you had to make it happen. No, you so those just, are other skills that have helped me. You couldn't just say, I'm really not feeling like writing today. So I'll turn my story in tomorrow. Not going to work. No, uh, no. You know what, what I was wondering about is I, I've done a fair amount of, um, I guess, journalistic writing, writing um, articles for, for people and research and managing research and the organization required so that the information you get on day one, you can find on day 30 when you're finally writing it. Did, have you found that that stuff as a journalist has helped you in writing fiction? Well, I, th I think what I did was, uh, if I had a certain topic, like um, what it was like for black businesses in the 1970s, I would just create a, a, a word file for it and, and stick those stories in it and, and for all the different topics I used. So I just I just had to be organized with my my you know word files and just organizing that way and the various topics I was going to. I tried to just print out things and they would get lost or you know I don't know what. So that I, I finally said I'm just going to make some electronic files of all the topics I'm covering and then go back to them when I get to that point. So I had the research right there. One of the things I always do is create an out file and and you already said that you had a lot of times where you would take out a, a subplot or take out a character and or I imagine you also combined characters that's that happens to me sometimes I realize two characters are serving the same purpose in the book so they get combined so did, did, did you save the stuff or did you just dump it no what I would do is um, I was really once I got through the entire manuscript I would go back to let's say chapter one and I would say no I'm not, I'm not sure if I did that or not but let's say chapter one take one and then I could see where there are things I wanted to change. Okay, chapter one, take two. Chapter one, take three. And so I would go from there. And then eventually I might say, oh, gee, what I said, what I, the other version was, was better. Let me go back to chapter one, take one and pull this out and put it over here. So I just kept each and every version of, of each part of what I did. So I could always go back to it if I needed to. Did you outline at any point? Did I outline? I don't think I. I did. I think I did outline. I did outline with, I did, with my professors when I was at Southern New Hampshire University in the MFA program. They had as outline. And, but my outline was more of a synopsis. Chapter one, this happens. You know, chapter two, this happens. So an outline in respect of, to help me remember, I would um, just put together just a small digest for each chapter of what happened in that chapter. find that helpful or just make work? It was, it was definitely helpful, definitely helpful. Did you keep updating it? Because that, that's a moving target every time you change something, or did you just let it go after you did it? The I, always, I always say that the pencil is my best friend. So I would pencil, I would write in pencil on these index cards and then go back and erase parts of it when, when, I, when I changed things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Pam says, I finished reading your wonderful book last night and I loved every page. Don't 
Thank you, Pam. I cannot wait to read your next work. Oh, that is so sweet. Thank you, yeah, Pam. This is, this is the Pam, I think it is. A, Pam and I were uh, in the French the high school exchange program in, in uh, well, high school exchange program in high school and went to France together when we were, when I was 16, she was 15. Oh, my goodness. Where in <laughs> France? Where, where, what? Oh, we were in France. We were in um, Paris for five days and then Aprilville uh, in, in Normandy. I went to Aprilville and some of our classmates went to other villages. I was in Aprilville. So we, we, were, we were all in Normandy. But did you go to school there or just long enough to visit? We were there three and a half weeks. So we did go to class, but it wasn't long enough to really get a feel for the classes. Okay. Any more questions out there? If anyone has any, now is your chance. In the meanwhile, I can ask another question. Well, can I ask you a question? I'd, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking that the, the, um, our listeners might be curious as to what are, I want to I I say this before we go any further, that um, I read your book, Never Tell a Lie. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I even mentioned to you that when, as I was reading it, I, I got to the last 30 pages I had to go to work the next day. It was 2.30 in the morning. And I said, I am not going to stop till I get to the end of this story. I had to find out what was going on. And my heart was racing as I, I was on flipping pages. I had to get to the end. So can you talk about what are the key elements that need to be in place to create a suspenseful novel? Uh, unanswered questions is, is the main thing. And questions that people care about. So when you wrote that scene with him going up the stairs and hearing the voice and hearing the music and coming in the room and you delayed whatever it was that was going on, that's suspense because we want to know what's he going to see when he opens the door. If we just plopped him in the door, opened it up and showed everything, there's no tension. And what suspense is all about is building that tension so that the reader wants to know what's going on. And the other thing I like to do is, uh, I, I call it putting the light bulb in the milk. <laughs> and that's uh, based on, there's a, uh, there's a book by, uh, no, a movie by uh, Hitchcock called um, Suspicion. And in it, uh, there's a, a wealthy woman and her gigolo husband. And I think Cary Grant plays the husband and Joan Fontaine plays the wife. And she thinks he's going to poison her. And the reader thinks he's going to poison her. And as the movie comes to its end, he climbs the stairs with a glass of milk on a silver tray. And the light goes down behind him and the banister shadows are like skeletons on the wall. And the light is on the milk and it seems to glow. And the reason it seems to glow is because Alfred Hitchcock put a light bulb in the milk. Mm. And so I always think that as a writer to create suspense, put a light bulb in the milk, make something that should be easy and normal and friendly, like the warm milk your mommy gives you when you can't sleep. Make that the thing that's the poison. Or he comes home and the phone is off the hook or the water is dripping in the bathtub down the stairs. You know, those moments when something isn't right and the reader has to figure it out. So that, those are my suspense. I love to write suspense. It's my favorite thing. Yeah. And, uh, and I noticed, oh, speaking of which, wait, I'm sorry, this is uh, off, the, off the topic, but briefly, the dumb waiter. Oh, yes. <laughs> The dumbwaiter is a, is a key thing in in your book. Yes, I don't want to give too much away. I can't say anything more about it. Okay. But when I saw it in the in Act One, the dumbwaiter, because because you see it, it it get introduced just as an aside. Oh, and there happened to be a dumbwaiter in this, and I'm like, bang, bang, bang! I know what she's going to do with the dumbwaiter. <laughs> oh, you see that? Well, yeah, of course, because you're the expert at sus suspense. Well, and and in um, what is the name of my book? Never tell a lie. That's how she escapes is uh, is she climbs into the dumbwaiter. It's not working. She has to go down the. Uh, mm -hmm. the but that's a very scary part of the book. <laughs> Thank you for the question. <laughs> so, do we have any more questions for our friends, or are we ready to say everyone 
buy the book from Belmont Books, buy my book from Belmont Books. But it's yes, you want to, your book, your new one is out. Um, my it new is, one's uh, out, yeah. Book. Careful what you wish for. That's you wish a, for because a much lighter it. thing than yours. It's about a it's about a woman who's a professional organizer married to a man who cannot pass a yard sale without stopping. And I am married to a man who cannot pass a yard sale without stopping. But you know, everything is coming up out of our basement in this pandemic. And I'm glad we have it. He had eight, eight jigsaw puzzles down there. Who knew? So, uh, so I've stopped complaining. No, I have not stopped complaining. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was going to say that I read your synop I read the synopsis online about this book, about your book, and I was mad because it didn't give me enough. I was like, well, I, I need more. I need more now. I want to know what is going on here. But that's what the suspense. Good. That's what that's what a good stuff. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks, Belmont Books. I don't know if if we still have Kayla. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, you, and I just want to say um, if. If by some chance you don't have a husband who's been packing away <laughs> jigsaw puzzles in your basement, okay. Mama Books is a great place to get jigsaw puzzles. Okay. Very good. <laughs> but thank you very much, Hallie and Lisa. This was wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Hallie. Thank and you. Well, and best of all, I, th I just thank Lisa because I had such a good time reading her book. Oh, good. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, I'm just going to do the announcements from the beginning again, because we had a lot of people who joined late. Um, but thank you both so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. And yeah, just as a reminder, um, the links to buy the books are in the chat over on the side. Um, and also you can just go to belmontbooks.com and then search to find the books as well. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. We're going to leave. So anybody who joined us late, um, just to let you know, we do have a lot of events coming up. Um, a couple in particular that I want to highlight, we have a book launch for Last Tang Standing by Lauren Ho in conversation with Mary Pauline Lowry. Next week, we have the book launch for The Gretchen Question by Jessica Treadway in conversation with Julia Glass. Um, in addition, we also have story time for kids on the weekends, and we do have monthly book clubs, both for adults and for kids. Um, Another announcement, we have curbside pickup opening this week again, and our pickup windows are Monday through Friday, 2 to 6, and Saturday, 12 to 4, and the way that you set up the curbside pickup is you just go onto our website, order your books, just like normal, um, and then in the space where you would select how you would want the shipping to be done, that's where you would select curbside pickup. So thank you so much for attending our event tonight. Hope to see you again at future events. Thank you.